please stand and join together in our call to worship. We give thanks to you, O Lord, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, your steadfast love endures forever. Open to us the gates of righteousness, that we may enter through them. This is the day of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I am the festival procession with branches. You are our God, and we will give thanks to you. You are my God, and we will extol you. We would ask if everyone could please sit and direct your attention to the back of the church for our procession of salt palms. <laughs>
we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's grace and love, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Gracious Father, you sent the Lord Jesus to enter our world and to save us from sin. But we confess that while we have been chosen to be servants, we have tried to be masters. We pretend that we are exceptions to humanity and hide behind the species. We lack the conscience that ought to accompany our Christian profession. Forgive us, O Lord, and deliver us from our living death. Give us the courage to accept the pain of new birth, so that we may be renewed and healed from all our brokenness, and that we may grow in favor with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins so that, free from sin, we might live for righteousness. Receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we stand sanctified, we stand justified, and our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. That's a dad. Who's driving this one? A mom. A mom. 
So this is a minivan. A llama. Right? And that probably says, like, oh, a six person Ooh, we're doing this very well. Okay. A six person family. Right, so we have a minivan. Has to haul some things. A dog. A lot of people. That's good. That's a good. dog. All right. I think we have home. that van and it's oh. still hard to we fit up. We do on. have a van like that. And that's because we've got a lot of people. We've got to take them. Yeah, we have. Okay. All right. So, let me, do you agree that maybe uh, the what you drive says a little bit about you? Maybe a little bit? Okay. Yeah. All right, because here's here's another one. What's this? It's a donkey. Oh, you're ancient. It is a donkey. Yeah. That's right, because today is Palm Sunday. You're 1,000 right? years old. And Palm Sunday is when Jesus came to Jerusalem, and do you know what he rode on his way to Jerusalem? A donkey. All right. Did he ride? A big camel all decked out in, you know, arrangements and very nice. Yeah. No. Did he ride a nice fast horse? Was he riding a fast horse? Yeah. No. All right. Now let me tell you. You're either Jesus okay. from heaven or you are ancient if you ride that. Oh, no. oh, so you're either Jesus or you're from olden times if you're riding a donkey. You're probably right about that. All right. So listen. In Jesus' time, a donkey was not the best way to get around. Right? Donkeys uh, tend to be stubborn. Uh, they don't go very fastly. They're not very smooth, all right? But in our scripture for today, Jesus specifically tells his disciples to go and get him. Right? He says, I want to ride this. And that means that it was something that Jesus was thinking about. Right? And that shows us, I think, because when Jesus came in on Palm Sunday, the palms that we have, the processional that we have, that was all to celebrate the fact that Jesus was coming in as a king, right? But to me, the fact that he was riding a donkey says that Jesus is going to be a different type of king than we expected. He's not coming in all fancy. He's coming in on a donkey, very humbly. And he's right? coming in so, And that's good because, you know, kings tend to think that they're on top and everyone's beneath. But Jesus as a king puts himself on bottom and everybody else up on top. And that's a different type of king. There are kings that that's like the best type for a bunch of kings. Those kings are rude. Just flat rude. Like, they have a thousand dollars and they won't give it. one person one dollar <laughs> for food. All right, we we'll won't get into that at children's worship when we go there. All right, but let's close with a prayer. All right, let's pray. I'll say some things and you will be happy. Dear God, Dear God, we thank you. We thank you. That you are humble. That you are humble. Help us. Help us. To be humble as well. We pray this. We pray this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now, wait just a second. We need to talk about some stuff. Because uh, if you are singing in, with the choir in the anthem, you need to stay here. If you are going down to children's worship with me after the anthem, we are going to sit right here until after the anthem. If you are going back to sit with your parents for the rest of the service, you may go and sit with your parents. So three choices. Singing, you're going to children's worship with me after the anthem, or you're sitting with your parents. Yeah. Dad, my parents, if I can go to children's worship, <laughs> you are welcome to do that. Dad, Dad, so, you know what a lot of parents are going to sing anything really much? I don't think it's really a choice for me. Like, I have to sit up there. Don't I? I have to. I don't have to. I know what to do.
was glorified in the music of the anthem, may he also be glorified in the reading of his word. Let us pray. O God, our, our Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. <coughs> The scripture reading for this Palm Sunday, as traditional, is the passage known as the Triumphal Entry. We can find this recorded in all four Gospels, but for today we will be reading from Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, which can be found on page 1572 of most of your pew Bibles. For a brief bit of background, uh, Prior to this chapter, Jesus is in the region of Jericho, which is about 14 miles or so from the Mount of Olives. Something interesting about the Mount of Olives, uh, it's less than two miles from Jerusalem, uh, on the east side of Jerusalem. And apparently the west uh, half of the Mount of Olives uh, was traditionally a, a cemetery or a place for tombs with an estimated 70,000 to 150,000 tombs, and part of the reason was a traditional, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> traditional Jewish belief that the Messiah would appear on the Mount of Olives and then make his way to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and so the, the resurrection would take place in, first in that area. With that in mind, let's listen to Mark chapter 11, first 11 verses. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the streets. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This ends the reading for the scripture for this morning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So much excitement shown in the demonstration of Jesus Christ arriving into Jerusalem for the Passover festival. His, word, his, his name had become well-known, 
by this time. People all throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, Galilee, they've heard of him. And they're wondering, could this be the long-expected Messiah finally making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem? One of the things we note about the way Mark, his gospel, tells the story, and uh, Philip is correct that the other gospels uh, give an account of the what we've come to call the triumphal entry. But Mark has his own particular spin on it, uh, because in Mark's gospel, he is constantly pointing out, or at least dropping the hints to the reader, that the people in the story have false expectations for the Messiah. They have this notion that the Messiah will be a regal figure. Someone in the line of King David who will be a king sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Or they may have the idea that he is an apocalyptic figure, a one like the Son of Man who will descend from the sky and bring angels of light to fight off the armies of darkness. These are among some of the ideas that, that the people of Jerusalem had about the coming of the Messiah. But in Mark's Gospel, we're constantly being shown that the Messiah is not who we think he is. I mean, maybe we do know who the Messiah is. And you had that wonderful story in chapter 8 where Jesus is at Philippi, uh, Caesarea Philippi with his disciples. He asked them, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter, speaking on behalf of the disciples, say, says to him, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And Jesus commends Peter for recognizing that he is the Messiah. And then he proceeds to explain to Peter and to the disciples what the Messiah must do. The Messiah is not going to sit on the throne. The Messiah is not going to bring armies of light to defeat the armies of darkness. What is the Messiah going to do, he says? The Messiah is going to be rejected by the chief priests, the scribes, He's going to be killed. This is the thing Jesus says about the Messiah. That that's, that's the Messiah's mission statement. To which Peter, again, acting on behalf of the disciples, rebukes Jesus. Saying, Jesus, oh come on, no. Jesus, yes, you're the Messiah. But you've got it all wrong. That's not what the Messiah does. How in the world could you possibly allow these things to happen to you, Jesus? We have seen that you, uh, that you have the ability to command nature, you still the storm. You have the ability to command demons, you cast them out. How in the world could you possibly believe that you, with your powers, could allow your mortal enemies, your mortal detractors, to get the upper hand on you? No, Jesus, you're mistaken. That is not who the Messiah is, or what the Messiah is. I'm not, I smile because it's just the, the height of hubris on the part of Peter to think that he knows better than Jesus what the Messiah is. But this is the running theme in Mark's gospel. Jesus is the Messiah that no one expects. In fact, he goes around in what we refer to often as the Messianic secret, trying to maintain, uh, to play down the role of the Messiah simply because Jesus knows well that people will have false, ex uh, uh, incorrect expectations for the Messiah. And it's illustrated right here in what you and I refer to as the triumphal entry. The expectations here are high. The crowd demonstrates their hopes for salvation. They're yelling exactly that. Hosanna. A Hebrew phrase from Psalm 118, verse 25, which means roughly, uh, please save, save us, please. Hosanna is what they're crying. What do they want to be saved from? They, they, they're, they're rallying around Jesus because they believe they, they can pin their hopes on him for a renewal of society. My Christian friends, when God's anointed king enters Zion, here he is. They're pinning their hopes for peace and justice, riding into Jerusalem, into this town. 
their hopes riding in with Jesus Christ. That's their expectation. You know, we, we often show the same kind of, of excitement in our expectations of new things. We, we are hoping, we get up in the morning hoping for a better future. Why else get up in the morning, right? My Christian friends, we get up thinking we're going to, there's a chance for a better future. We certainly see that, for example, in the birth of a child. Here is the hope of a, of a better future. Maybe the children can do better in this world than, than we have as adults. We haven't done as good a job as we had hoped. Maybe we went forward in our younger days thinking we could do a better job, but, but things just didn't turn out right. So we, we now pin our hopes on the next generation for a better future. We hope for a renewal of life. We hope for uh, a renewal of, of, uh, uh, of, of society. Whenever we go to the polls and elect our new leaders, thinking certainly this time we're going to get the leadership that will, will bring us down the, 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 the right path. We hope for a renewal of faith and spirituality. We hope for all of these things as we look to the future. But that excitement that the crowd had in Jerusalem becomes tarnished and tainted very quickly. The anointed king who entered Jerusalem did not unseat Rome. He did not take the throne in Jerusalem. He did not kick out the Romans. The Christ of God who entered Jerusalem did not depose those religious hypocrites in the temple. He didn't do that. He may have called them out, but he didn't depose them. The old religious institutions remained in place. The hope of them all, the hope of us all, Jesus the Christ, walked into the temple, looked around, and left. He walked in the temple, he looked around, and he left. What a disappointment. This guy is not proving to be the Messiah we thought he was going to be. We know that feeling, my Christian friends. We, we pin our hopes on a brighter future. But what we discover is that it brings new problems, problems we hadn't thought about before. We pin our hopes on a renewal of society, but we discover even there, there's poverty and injustice. We pin our hopes on the renewal of our own lives, but we discover that this brings new sins. And our hopes on a renewal of faith and spirituality, only to find that with that comes along new doubts, new fears. No, my Christian friends, we talk about the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ, but the triumph of Christ is not his victory over Rome. It's not his victory over the temple. The real triumph of Jesus Christ will come a week later. resurrection from the dead after having died on the cross. The power of the cross is what he's there for. That's what he told Peter. That's what he's been telling us all along. That's the role of the Messiah. He comes to make us right with God where we have not been right before. He undergoes the suffering, as we say in the Apostles' Creed. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He acknowledges that suffering when he speaks about his rejection with the chief priests and scribes. As he talks to the disciples about the role of, of what it means to be the Christ, to be the Messiah, he's, he will eventually come to be abandoned and rejected and betrayed by the very persons who love him, who are on his side. 
That's what the Messiah does. He comes into this world, this broken world, and suffers for us. Not because God desires suffering, not because Christ desires suffering. We know that Christ cares about our suffering. He feeds the 5,000. He heals the sick. No, the necessity of Christ's suffering is simply resides in its inevitability. Unfortunately, suffering is the price of loving. When we love others, we bear their suffering. What does it make? What sense does it make to talk about loving someone if you're not willing to walk with them and hold their hands through their pain? What kind of love is that? That's why we call it compassion. Literally, and we don't, we don't pay close enough attention to that word. The word compassion literally means from the Latin to suffer together with someone. That's compassion. Christ had compassion for us. Leaving the realm of, of bliss in order to enter the brokenness of human life, which entails suffering. And when Christ goes to the cross, he may redeem us before God. He does not take away suffering. He doesn't save you and me from suffering, my Christian friends, but he does redeem it. He changes the meaning of suffering. That's why he keeps saying to the disciples, take up your cross and follow me. What is usually that temptation to avoid to do the good thing, the right thing, the noble thing, the pains that we would suffer in doing so, he's saying that's he is transforming the meaning of that pain. The very power of pain and suffering is now transformed into the power of the cross, which we are called to take up. And we do it for the love of God, for the love of our neighbors. That's compassion. That's what the Messiah does. He is not the Messiah we would have hoped for. We would like a Messiah who will give us an easy life, who would give us a land flowing with milk and honey, who would give us political leaders, who would reign benevolently. That's the kind of life you and I would want from a Messiah. But instead, he is the Messiah who calls us to take up the cross. The Messiah who calls us to love others even to the point of suffering with them, as he did for us. The real triumph of Jesus Christ is the cross, my Christian friends. When he entered Jerusalem, this Messiah created events which resulted in his crucifixion. You, didn't, you don't have to be the Son of God to know that this man's life was going to be taken. As soon as he started to overturn the tables of the money changers, the death, the death warrant was already written for him. Jesus was not poised to, to become the great king that we would hold up in our honor. No, he becomes a criminal, guilty of sedition. And we Christians are his followers. Followers in humiliation of a man who by social standards is considered to be a criminal. The name Christian itself was a deplorative term given to us for that very reason. Christ was crucified, and people start calling us Christians, little Christ, because that's what they say we deserve too. We should be crucified too. And you know, Christians have decided, I'll take that on. I'll bear that cross. The Messiah did it for me. I am willing to have compassion and love for others. So call me Christian. Call me Christian. That's the true expectation that we should have of the Messiah. A transformation of the way we are, the way we think. I think the Apostle Paul says it best, do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. We are transformed by the power of the cross, my Christian friends. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name.
has called us to faith in the proclamation of the word, may we now reaffirm that faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Disaster assistance. It restores the streets we live in. And this helps uh, folks in the U.S. and uh, in other countries, uh, natural disasters that have struck. You may remember last year, Syria had a devastating earthquake. Uh, PDA helped with that. Uh, in Malawi and southern Africa, a cyclone destroyed a number of crops. Uh, wildfires uh, have ra raged. California and Texas, and floods have uh, ravaged eastern Kentucky. Second, the Presbyterian Hunger Program helps share bread with the hungry. And uh, we know even just here in our community, hunger is a problem uh, here and worldwide. So that, that's an important ministry. And the third thing is self-development of people. Help loose the bonds of injustice. So these, these three uh, areas are what the money for the one great hour sharing helps with. Uh, I'll throw out some other statistics because I, I like numbers. Um, over 55,000 pounds of seeds and seed, seedlings were distributed for farming. I'm not a gardener, so I don't know, but Jen, you can probably back me up. That's a lot of seeds and seedlings. Uh, 105 women became self-employed in Malawi and 152 people won their land back in Sri Lanka. I know Bonnie Gray would have some other wonderful stories to tell, um, so 
pray for her, remember her as her arthritis and her knee acts up, but uh, most of all, open your hearts and your wallets uh, for the one great hour sharing. Thank you. Philip, thank you so much. I appreciate that good word. Um, I believe, by the way, there, there may actually be a, a few other items that are also uh, uh, recipients of the uh, one great hour of sharing, but those are, uh, I appreciate hitting those highlights. Thank you. My Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, we are on our spiritual journey through the season of Lent, and we realize that the culmination of that journey is now soon to be realized. We pray that you will keep us focused in our humility. Keep us focused as we recognize our part in the sins of the world as we recognize the great gift of your son Jesus Christ who comes into the world in order to reconcile us to you and to reconcile us to one another and to reconcile us even to our own selves we are grateful for the great gift of your sacrifice we deserve your place and realize that we do not have the ability to take on the sins of the world. So knowing of the great sacrifice that you have done for us, we give you thanks and pray that by your spirit, you will move in us, even in our shortcomings, to be as worthy as we can. Move in us that we can be justified, that we can be sanctified, that our sins can be forgiven, and that we might be one with you in righteousness and truth, and that we might be one with one another through compassion and grace. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. He who taught us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My Christian friends, having heard how Christ has made the great sacrifice on our behalf, it is always appropriate for our Christians in worship to offer ourselves also to one another in love and in compassion. During the time of the offertory, may we use that time to reflect, to meditate on our own self-giving.
you model the exemplar for us all. May we give up ourselves, not in any effort to procure the salvation of the world, but in faithful response, in love for others, in love for you. Receive, we pray, these gifts given as signs of our very lives, given for service and love to you and others. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. <laughs>